Welcome to the AWS Account Administration and Networking for Higher Education presentation. Uh, this is the billing and cost management section. First, let's talk about AWS organizations and consolidated billing. So the first account in your AWS organization is billed for all charges. However, when you get your bill, you'll be able to see what each other account in your organization, what their actual charges were as well. Just a note that if you're an Internet 2 slash DLT customer, you can skip this section on consolidated billing as DLT is going to be your payer account. Why would you consider AWS organizations and consolidated billing instead of just having standalone AWS accounts? Well, with organizations and consolidated billing, you get one bill for multiple accounts. You also get to aggregate your AWS usage enterprise-wide so you can take advantage of our volume discounts and S3 and EC2. You can also monitor cost and usage using the Cost Explorer from the central billing account. Also, you get cost and usage reports in a machine-readable format that you can then uh, parse with either something like Excel or any other spreadsheet program or third-party tools. So let's talk about inviting existing AWS accounts to an organization. An invitation can only be initiated from the master account in the organization, and the invited AWS account can accept or decline that invitation. The default action is decline. You can control who can accept or decline these invitations with IAM permissions. Once an invitation is accepted, the AWS account becomes a member of your organization and any applicable organizational control policies get automatically applied to that account. Invited accounts can be removed from your organization. However, accounts that are automatically created from the organization, they cannot be removed from the organization. Cost and usage reports. You can receive month to date and final billing reports in a machine readable format using the cost and usage reports. You can get a consolidated reports for all accounts under a pair using these reports. You can break down charges by things like AWS account, type of usage, and user defined tags to get really granular billing information to be able to do a proper chargeback. Let's talk about how consolidated billing works with S3. So all usage in this example for a linked account family will add up to about 90 terabytes. So we've got multiple accounts here. We've got a pair account, an engineer account, a sciences account, and a liberal arts account. And the account usage is combined, and then a blended rate is computed. So because there are volume and tier discounts for things like S3, the more storage you have in S3, the lower your actual per gigabyte rate is. So the blended rate is basically a rate that takes those discounts into consideration. And so the blended rate is used to compute the actual bill for each account in the family. So even though, let's say, the engineering account or their liberal arts account, they don't necessarily qualify for the blended rate on their own. Once you consider the usage of the whole account family, they are qualified, so they end up saving money even though their usage is under the, the typical discount. Let's talk about consolidated billing and EC2 reserved instances. So reserved instances allow you to reserve Amazon EC2 instances for one or three years in exchange for a discounted hourly rate. A reserved instance is a capacity reservation, but not a virtual machine. So you can think of a reserved instance as essentially a coupon that you can apply to instances that you have running after the fact. There are three different pricing models for reserved instances. They are all upfront. Uh, so with all upfront, you essentially pay for the whole compute time for the duration of the reserved instance, and it gives you the largest discount. And after you get an upfront, all upfront array, there's no hourly charge. There's also a partial upfront, which is a medium discount, uh, and you pay a reduced hourly charge. And then there's no upfront. So no upfront, you don't pay any kind of upfront fees. You just make a one-year commitment for the term of the RI, and you get a good discount with that as well. Let's talk about consolidated billing and easy to reserved instances. You want to make sure that you choose the right type of reserved instance for your workloads. So there's three different types of reserved instances. The first is standard reserved instances. These provide the most significant discount, which is up to 75% of on-demand pricing and are the best suited for steady state usage. Then there's also convertible reserved instances. These provide a discount of up to 45% of on-demand pricing in the capability to change the attributes of the reserved instance as long as the exchange results in the creation of reserved instances of equal or greater value. Like standard reserved instances, convertible reserved instances are best suited for steady state usage. The advantage you get with them is you can switch your eyes across instance families after the fact. Whereas with a standard reserved instance, you can only change to an instance of the same family. Then there's also scheduled reserved instances. With these, you're able to launch within specific time windows that you reserve. This option allows you to match your capacity reservation to a predictable recurring schedule that only requires a fraction of a day, week, or month. So for example, if you have a scheduled task that needs to run on an EC2 instance, say two hours out of the day, um, and you'd like to take advantage of reserved uh, pricing, you can get a scheduled reserved instance for this use case. 
let's talk about some things that you need to consider when choosing the right type of RI for your workloads. So the first thing you want to consider is the term. You can get a one or three year RI for standard reserved instances. And with a one year RI, you get about a 40% savings off of on-demand pricing. With a three year RI, you get about a 60% savings off of on-demand pricing. With a convertible RI, you can only do three year RIs and you get about a 45% savings off on-demand pricing. For both convertible and standard RIs, you can change the availability zone, instance size, and networking type uh, of your instances. And in terms of changing instance families, operating systems, tenancy, and payment options, you can do all of those on convertible RIs. Uh, on standard RIs, uh, we just introduced something called instance flexibility. So within the same instance family, if you have an RI, and if, if it's unutilized, and let's, so let's say you have an M4X large RI, but you've got two M4 large instances running, with the new EC2 instance flexibility option, your M4X large RI will automatically apply as two M4 large RIs in this scenario. So, however, you still can't change instance families, and several other things in standard RIs. In terms of selling your RIs on the RI marketplace, uh, for standard RIs you can sell them on the RI marketplace after linking your AWS account with an US billing account or a bank account. And you cannot yet do that on convertible RIs, but that is coming soon. Lastly, let's talk about reserved instance affinity. So RI hours are applied preferentially to the account that owns the RI. This means the account where the RI was originally purchased and any leftover hours are applied to usage of the same instance type and the same availability zone in other accounts. A blended cost is computed as well, and for that we assume 720 hours in a month. So for example, in this case there's 60 hours from the engineering account that were applied to the liberal arts accounts on demand usage because they were unutilized by the engineering account. 